So visual effects in today's modern day and age is getting easier and easier. So easy actually that we're gonna leave the studio and all of our equipment behind taking nothing but a laptop and a few cameras to create some visual effects on location in no time at all. So let's go. And to see what the lighting is looking like, we want to switch it to Cyclist Render Engine. Here, that should actually work. So, so easy, it should probably be illegal. Get photos straight into the app. Holy cow. A big thanks to MSI for making this video possible with their Creator 15 laptop series here, which will work amazing for visual effects on the go. Because it has a super bright 4K HDR compatible screen paired with a 100 watt battery, making it possible to work outdoors on it for hours. It's also lightweight and portable for how much power it packs with the NVIDIA RTX 3070 mobile paired with a fast Intel 8 core 16 thread processor. To learn more about the MSI Creator 15, check out the links in the description below. I'll also include a few links down there where you can find the Creator 15 series on sale and bundled with some goodies. So thanks again to MSI for partnering on this video. And now let's see how fast we can create some dope visual effects. So obviously to add visual effects to something, we need some video to add effects into. And so you should film something probably handheld because it looks more impressive and it's more of a pain in the ass. <laughs> But no, make it some handheld footage because we're definitely doing some camera tracking. One way to do this is so, so easy. It should probably be illegal because it's just that cheating. And it's using one of the newer iPhones because you can now use an app called CamTrack AR, which uses the AR elements in an iPhone to actually camera track and film video at the same time. And there's a free add-on for Blender that allows you to import your tracking data straight into Blender after you capture it through this app. So it's really easy, you just set up a pivot point in the app and start filming footage. This is super great for really fast and dirty visual effects, but the downsides are you have to film with iPhone quality video, and then you also lose any ability to adjust the track later on, so you're kind of stuck with whatever results you get. Probably something you shouldn't use in more professional work. Then the other option is filming with your phone camera, that's something everyone has access to, or a DSLR like I'm filming with here. That should actually work. Oh, hey, something I'm actually pretty excited about is the CG Geek hat just released. The first CG Geek merch actually available with the link in the description there and down in the merch cell. It's a wait, it's a wait, wait. <laughs> it's a great way to support the channel if you guys enjoy the content and get a cool looking hat. Okay, so now that we have some camera footage that we can use in our scene, we need a few more elements from the environment that we're using to add CG into. The first one is 360 lighting. To get the best looking results, you actually kind of want to get a 360 of the environment that you're dropping your 3D elements into. So for your environment lighting, there's also a few methods depending on what you might have available to you. The best method is actually capturing your own 360 environment for dynamic lighting in the scene that you're actually dropping your elements into. And that would be using something like a 360 camera like I have here. This little Insta360 One camera is actually quite affordable nowadays and it will capture a full 360 photo. And then just using the Insta360 app on your phone, you can wirelessly control your camera using Bluetooth to capture different photos at different exposures. And when you have a handful of different 360 photos, shot at different exposures, you can drop them all into an app like Photoshop, and here you can quickly combine them all using an automated process to create a high dynamic range 360 image, one that can be opened right up into Blender. So that's all great and fine and dandy if you happen to have a 360 camera, but if you didn't spend a few hundred bucks to have a 360 camera, you're not out of luck because there's websites like HDR Haven, which offer a huge range of 360 HDRs that you can download for free and use in your scenes. So if you're not making your own HDR, just download an HDR that matches the overcastness of the day that you shot your footage on, along with the color of the sky, which will be the most important elements of the photo to match your 3D lighting to that of your footage. And then the next step that I recommend you do, and it's super easy nowadays, is a photo scan of the environment where you're dropping your 3D elements into. This will work really well for light bounces, shadows, and masking. And as always, you have a few methods for capturing these 3D photo scans. So the super quick and dirty way of photo scanning is using an app on your phone. If you happen to have an iPhone that has the LiDAR scanner on it, this can happen in a matter of seconds. That's how easy it is. Just download a free app. The one I'm using in this video is the 3D scanner app. And literally all you have to do is push the record button and then as you move around with your phone camera, the app automatically starts 3D photo scanning everything you pass with your lens as if it was taking a video. So this is extremely fun to actually play around with. Now everyone doesn't have access to the newer iPhones and the 3D LiDAR scanner, but that's okay because there's another free option that will work for everyone. And that is using the free open source software Meshroom like I've used a few times on the channel already. And any old camera, the one that comes in your smartphone is gonna work just fine. Just take a wide range of photos, some close, some far from every different angle. Again, capturing some of the outside elements 
of the environment as well. So now you have all of your photos captured, you can download the free open source software Meshroom and drag all of your photos straight into the app. Holy cow! There's cows right there. Hey cows. Oh, hey. Say hi cow. Don't eat my computer cow. There you go. There you go. I, uh, I guess I just continue. Yeah, we'll just continue. So within Meshroom, if you want the quickest, fastest results, you really don't actually have to change anything. The default settings are pretty good. All you have to do is save your project once your photos are loaded in, and then click Start. The length of how long this will take to process is going to depend on your hardware a little bit, but running on the Creator 15 laptop here with the RTX 3070 mobile GPU, along with Intel's i7 8-core 16-thread CPU, it's happening pretty quickly, as you might imagine. So within Blender, the first thing you want to do is just create a new visual effects file scene. And then, of course, just open up the clip we just captured. Then under the output properties, we can just put in the frame rate that we shot the video at, along with the aspect ratio, which was 1080p. But now it's time to do a quick and dirty track on our footage. So what I'm going to start off by doing is just changing the tracking settings to the preset by clicking the option here and going to blurry footage. As I found, this just does the best overall tracking job with a wide variety of footage. You can increase the pattern size a little bit, going up to something like 51 is pretty good. Along with the search size, 101 is pretty good. It will slow down the track just a little bit. Now, a slow way of tracking is to put a million trackers by hand all over the scene. Fast way is to cheat and just go detect features. Now, detect features isn't going to be the greatest because it's going to track things that we don't really want to track super well, like myself. But that's okay because we can clean it all up later. So I'm just going to detect features. And then with all of them selected, track all of those markers forward. As you can see, most of those are actually tracking pretty well still. Here it is at 240 frames, so we can just change the end frame here to 240. There's some loud birds up there. Shut up, crowds! <laughs> Trying to film something! Thank you. Appreciate it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit A and hide all of those tracks that I just made by hitting H. And then I'm going to jump to the end frame, which is 240 here. Click Detect Features again to add in all new tracks and tracks and then track them back the opposite direction. So if I go Alt-H to unhide the tracks from the first round, we have a lot of tracks to work with here. So what I can do here now is jump over to the Solve tab. And because I know what the focal length of the camera was, I can save a little bit of time and effort by punching those settings in manually. So under Track, I'm gonna go down to the Camera Settings, and here under Lens, I'm just gonna make sure that it's set to 24 millimeters, which is actually what I shot this footage on. So the first settings in the Solve tab are Keyframe A and B. You wanna set these between two frames on your video clip that has the most sort of perspective change shift in the lens. It's a little confusing, but just kind of scrub through your video. Right around 130 to 140 it actually looks pretty good for me. With that done, there's a few trackers that we can obviously delete before we get to solving, and that's going to be the trackers on myself here. So just go ahead and hit X and delete any trackers that are on your character that might be moving around, because obviously those aren't going to track too well. But with that said and done, select all your trackers and click Solve Camera Motion. As you can see, we actually got a pretty good solve error of just 0.87 there. That's actually pretty respectable. But we can clean that up more by going down to the Cleanup tab. Here you're going to set the frames to 25 and the error to 3. I don't want any of those tracks, so I'm just going to hit X and delete them now. And with just that done, we should be able to just solve the camera motion again here. Great, anything under a 1 in the solve error is pretty solid, and we can totally work with that. So now you can just click Setup Tracking Scene and Set as Background. And if we switched over to the 3D viewport, you can see that we now have a cube here with a plane. And if I play the video back here, you can see that that cube is locked onto our footage and moves exactly with our camera motion. Now it's time to add in some of that lighting, whether or not you captured it with a 360 camera or you're just going to use HDR Haven to find some awesome HDRs to sort of match your lighting. Now's the time to do it. So to open up that HDR now in Blender, we're just going to jump to the world properties here and click the little button next to the color. Here we're just going to choose environment texture and open up an HDR. Now if I jump to viewport shading and rendering, bada bing bada boom, you can see our HDR loaded up in the background there. Oh hey look, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> now what you want to do is open up a new window with the shader editor, change it to the world settings, and if you have the node regular add-on enabled, which you totally should, all you have to do is grab your HDR node and go control T to add in a mapping node. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to rotate the HDR now around on the Z axis to position it very similarly to the way the footage was shot. And as you can see that's going to work as we have the sunlight coming from over there. You can delete any lamps in the scene already because we're not going to need those. And to see what the lighting is looking like we want to switch it to Cycles Render Engine which actually uses the environment lighting accurately. Switch it to GPU Compute so we're using the RTX 3070 in the Creator 15 laptop here for rendering. And let's take a look at how that photo scan is processing. 
Hey, that's looking pretty good. So let's drop like a cool looking robot now into the background of our scene. And to do that, it's quite easy. Let's just make sure that we're on our foreground collection layer there. And now I'm just going to go a pen. This is the simple quad bot from Tears of Steel. If you guys want to add this same robot to your scene, you can download it from Blend Swap. I've just added all of the elements to this robot to a single collection that I'm going to go jump into the collection here. All right, and with our big bot here scaled up in the background, we'll just go ahead and give it a quick render, see what it looks like in the viewport. And that's actually looking really sweet. You can see the environment lighting, letting it light the scene accurately to the way it was shot. So now it's time to use that 3D photo scan of the ground that we captured. As you can see, it was processing in the background here on the laptop in Meshroom, and it has now completely finished. So let's go ahead and import that photo scan and see what we got. So I'm just gonna go ahead and quick hide the objects in the scene. And now I'm just going to go file import OBJ. Under the photo scan, you're gonna to go to where you saved your file. And if you go to the texturing tab, you'll see a folder that contains your finished textured mesh. We're just gonna grab the object file right there and click import object. And there's our photo scan of the environment. Looks like it's upside down right now. So I'm gonna rotate that 180 degrees. We'll jump to our camera view and we'll scale it up. And before I do anything, I'm gonna reduce the quality of this mesh quite a bit by adding in a decimate modifier here. As you can see, we're sitting at over 300,000 faces. That's more than we need. I'm gonna collapse that down to 0.2. And that will still have plenty of quality in it for our needs here and run a lot faster in the viewport. So with that done, I'm just gonna click the drop down there, click apply. Now what I'm gonna do with this mesh is I'm gonna actually drop it right into the background layer there as well, just like we have with the ground mesh, except we don't need the ground mesh anymore. And then under the properties, we're gonna make this just a shadow catcher. So it renders as nothing but the shadows. But I also want some of those environment light bounces. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna duplicate that mesh. You can see we now have two of them here. And I'll drag this one into our foreground collection. And then this one, I'm gonna uncheck shadow catcher. So it's actually Actually rendering but I'm just gonna turn off the ray visibility to the camera so we'll still have it interacting with light bounces and stuff to the object a bonus tip is you can actually also add some foliage to this plane then as a particle system and that will work as more masks to make it look like there's maybe blades of grass or something in front of the robot making it blend better with the environment not something we're gonna bother with this video but just a tip that you guys can take so a few render settings now to put some extra realism to the scene we're gonna jump to the render layers here we'll start off by enabling the mist pass that will help give a little bit of extra detail then scroll down and enable the indirect and direct glossy passes. Scroll down a little bit further, enable ambient occlusion, and that will do it. Now you also want to jump to the background layer and enable ambient occlusion on this layer as well. With the camera selected, you can enable depth of field as well. In the viewport display, if you choose limits and mist, you can kind of see what the camera settings are going to be set to. Here I'm going to choose the distance of a little bit closer, leave the focal length at around a 2. That will give just a very little bit of blur to our character, which will make it look a little bit more realistic being rendered there. I'm going to pull a focus distance in a little bit closer, as the camera was focused on myself in the video, not the robot behind me. And then if we go to the world settings, we can change the mist pass here a little bit. Those are actually set pretty good by default in this scene, but if you need to adjust them, the world settings here is where you would do that. All right, with all those settings set up, though, we can give our scene a quick render. As you can see, the camera motion's there. Character's ready to be rendered. We just need a little bit of compositing to finish off this scene. Under the film settings in the world property, you also want to make sure that transparent is checked. Should now be ready to render an image. And there we go, our render is finished. As you can see, just using the default nodes that we get when we click setup tracking scene, our composite actually already looks kind of cool. It definitely can be improved though, and that's what we're gonna do now by adding in some of those extra render passes that we just rendered out. So let's work on the ambient occlusion, and we'll go ahead and add that to our background layer here. So if I control shift click on the layer, you can see we have the ambient occlusion pass, which looks pretty cool, but needs to be cleaned up a little bit. So for starters, we can add it to our scene by adding in a color mix node, dropping it right after the first alpha over there, and changing it to multiply we'll add the AO right into the bottom socket and as you can see we now have ambient occlusion but we also have the background being added to it we don't want that we can clean that up real quick with another mix node so I'm gonna go shift a add in a color mix node drag it right into the AO pass there this time we'll change it to screen and now all you have to do is connect the alpha to the bottom socket there invert the alpha there by going shift a color invert dragging it right into the alpha pass there, and we can see we get rid of the background. And a subtle bit of ambient occlusion adds a little bit of realism to the scene. While we're doing the ambient occlusion thing, let's go ahead and add it to our quad bot as well. It's time to add the glossy render passes that we rendered out. For this, I'm gonna use a color mix node as well. Drag it to the end of your node tree here, change it to add, and then we'll drag the glossy indirect right into the bottom socket there. And as you can see, that's a very strong amount of glossy, but it already is kind of tying in the environment by giving you those green reflections on the robot. I'll take it down to a value of about 0.2, so it's not over the top. And then we'll duplicate that add node one more time. 
this time grab the glossy direct, drag it into the bottom socket. And as you can see, that's looking pretty cool as well, adding that extra layer of shine over the robot. Again, maybe a little strong, so we'll take it down to about a 0.12, but it is looking pretty cool. Now, the last step to really pull the robot into the environment is to add just a subtle amount of mist. And as you remembered, we rendered out a mist pass as well. So we'll go ahead and duplicate that add node drop it at the bottom, change it over to mix, drag the mist pass, put it into the top socket there. Then you want to select the mist pass on your quad bot render layer and drag it into the factor of that mix node. Here you're going to want to pick sort of a light blue, barely light blue maybe color to mix the haze in the scene that it might've been shot in. And then just like with our AO passes, we need to remove the background here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a color mix node again. We'll change this one to multiply. And we're just going to take the alpha from that quad bot layer into the bottom socket, the mist into the top socket. We now have just our robot without the mist affecting the background at all. But you can see the edges are a little bit jagged here. That can be cleaned up really easy. For this, we're just going to go shift A, add in a filter, dilate and erode. We'll go ahead and drag it over the alpha pass here in our multiply node. We're just going to change it to feather and I'll give it a distance of something like seven. As you can see, that's the wrong direction. So we want to go negative seven and that looks pretty clean. So now we're gonna use this as the new mix factor right there. A little strong, I might say. So we'll go ahead and duplicate that mix node, drag the previous node to the bottom socket so we can control how much this node is actually doing anything here with this value. Also, if you have some edges showing up on your 3D model, try checking convert pre-multiply. That can often fix these alpha issues. And now the last step to tie in your monster robot with your visual effects might be to actually set it behind your character. Because if I zoom in here, you can actually see the quad bot is in front of me. I'm supposed to be behind it. This is done really easy with masking right inside of Blender. For that, we'll just switch to the masking tab, as you can see here. And we'll switch from tracking over to mask. Here we can go ahead and create a very quick mask right inside of Blender by holding down Control and left clicking. This will drag out a handle. And if you just continue clicking, you can see that we drag out multiple handles. And we'll just go ahead. And then if I shift select the last handle, you can go Shift C to close that off. Or is it Alt C? Yes, it's Alt C. There we go, just a quick and dirty mask to show you the process. Now if you jump back to your compositing tab, and if you want to open up that mask, you're just going to go Shift A, add in an input. This time we're going to choose mask. And under that mask, we're going to select the only mask there that we created. Now the easiest way to just add this back in without changing any of your visual effects is simply grab an alpha over node here, duplicate it, drag it to the very bottom, take your footage, Go ahead and drag that into the bottom socket of that new alpha over node, and then take your mask and use that as the factor to that alpha over node. Bada bing, bada boom. We just stuck our head right over the monster. For an animation, of course, you just want to enable automatic keyframing and then move through your footage and grab that mask and move it to match your character. So you'll have to tweak this throughout uh, your frames. And if you want to render out an animation, you could have a sweet robot right in the background of your scene doing whatever you want him to do. Maybe a dance or something. I, I don't know. But that's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked the video, well, you know what to do. And uh, if you had a question, leave it in the comment section below. Thanks so much again to MSI for sponsoring this video. And I'll probably see you all in another video. So.